All right, so if you have your Bible, would you join me in Romans chapter 11? We're back talking about surviving suffering. This is a hard topic, of course, uh, for many of us that have gone through uh, times and seasons of suffering or uh, that we're in right now uh, with uh, COVID-19. But either way, when we talk about suffering, it's best to to talk about this head on and, and really to look at the scriptures and to have a biblical understanding of, of what suffering is to be. And this is going back to two weeks ago or a week ago when I talked about this. I think from even from personal experience and, and being at the bedside of many other people that have good-hearted people, mature Christians that have gone through seasons of suffering, uh, for us, it for anybody really, it tends to, suffering tends to uh, affect us in such a way that we kind of lose our bearings. We, we The truth in the good seasons that we embrace, the, the Bible verses that we memorize, just the principles of, of Christ that we know, believe, and walk in day to day as, as believers, even for the most mature, when suffering hits. And we kind of have this understanding of how I'm going to deal with suffering. But when suffering does actually hit and we're in it, in the storm, in the middle of the storm, it's just different. Uh, the raw emotion, the raw effect, uh, on our physical bodies, much less emotionally and mentally and spiritually. Uh, all that plays a role, and we tend to lose our bearings. It, it happens, right? And, and many times we need other people to help us in that. But at the same time, uh, we need to be have a full understanding of, of, of what the Scriptures uh, teach us about suffering and how we are to walk in those things. And, and this passage, I think, is helpful. Romans Chapter 11, starting in verse 32, just a few verses. This is Paul talking to the church of Rome. For God, I'm sorry, verse 33, uh, chapter 11. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord and who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. I want to read that one more time. Verse 33, chapter 11. I love how he starts with the word, oh. Not just a statement, but it's a statement of worship. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Think back to Job, the story of Job, when Job is questioning God, why is this happening and, and what, are you, what are you doing? And, and God just gently, but uh, as a way of instructing, Job, where were you? You can ask me questions. I allow that. It's okay to ask questions, but I'm also going to ask you a question because I want to teach you. Where were you when the cosmos were formed? Where were you when the universe was created? Where were you when water was made? Where were you when, like, colors were invented, when smells were invented? Like, like, there's a difference. There's a, a divide in our knowledge between us and God. And anybody that has kids knows this. So uh, I, I, love, I love my children. I, I love my house. I love, I love my family. That's a true statement. But there's a lot of conversation with any parent and any child where a child would say, uh, I don't agree with this time of going to bed. I don't agree with this uh, uh, amount of food. I, I don't agree with that I have to sit down and, and eat this food. I don't agree with the time allotted for me to play outside. You know, there's this kind of childlike response to authority that I think it should be this way, and your way of parenting me is not right, not fair. And, uh, I mean, how many times has has a child said to a parent, my way is better? Uh, I hear it all the time in my house. Uh, You're not in charge. I've had my... Son, whom I love, look at me in the eye and say, you are not in charge of me. And for me to look back at him and say, oh, yes, I am. I am in charge of you. Uh, we're going to bed 
now, not later. There's no agreement. Uh, there, this is good. F- sleep is good for you. It's good for your mother and dad, but it's also good for you. It's not good for you to stay up late. But in his mind, as a five and six, you know, six-year-old, he thinks it's good, and it's not. Uh, eating sugar and ice cream all the day long before going to bed is not good. It's not healthy. But in his mind, he's convinced it is. So if that is the divide of a six-year-old and a grown parent, how much more is the divide between us and the sovereign God of the universe? Listen, my point is this, and I think Romans 11 is speaking to this as well. Oh, the depth and the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. It's just, it's clear and it's true that God is going to allow and author some things to happen in the universe and in our own personal world where we are 110% convinced that this is not good. We are 110% that no good could ever come from this. And the actual truth is, is that God is allowing it for a good reason. Now, when we think about that, you should think, well, what about this and what about this? And how could any good, any good come from this? And there's all these examples we come up with. And to any human mind, it seems, yeah, how could anything good? There, there's no possible way. You're telling me that God would allow that? You're telling me that God would allow, that something good can come out of that? You are sick and insane, and unstable. But the truth is, is that we worship a God for a good reason. He's other. His his way of thinking is different. Uh, His way of uh, doing things is drastically and radically different. Let's Let's just pretend for a moment. Let's all be heretics for one second. If you are God, and I'm God, and you control everything, you control... Uh, every, every leader, every president, uh, every governing society on the whole world, you have a plan and you are guiding things into your plan and into your will. You have a plan. You have a future that you want to see happen. And these things have to line up a certain way for that thing to happen. That's God. God is not a God who's in heaven going, well, I'll just let things play out and we'll eventually get to where I want to be. No, no, God has a purpose and has a will and has a plan. So there's things that, that, that have to line up for that plan. That's just part of it. Well, if you're God and, and, and you're orchestrating those things, well, then there's going to be things that you say that people just don't understand. I mean, t- if you're a leader or you're a business owner or you have anybody that works underneath you, you for sure have come into the season or the day or the hour or the time or whatever, the week where you go, look, this, this is a decision I'm making and it has to happen. And everybody goes, what? That's, that's insane. Why in the world would we do that? But you having other conversations with your bosses, there's a whole understanding of this is how, for, these re- for this reason, this has to happen, Right? I mean, we're facing that right now in this pandemic, uh, that our leaders uh, that we trust in government, whether it's the state or our nation, get together. uh, They see the facts. They see the data. This has to happen for this number to get better. Uh, For this to go like this and this, (laughs) then these things have to happen. And of course, you have a society of people that go, absolutely not. That's crazy, right? Well, it may seem crazy, But the truth is these things have to happen. These things have to take place. So if that's true of the human, how much more is it with the God of creation and the God of our future? There's going to be things that take place in our life and in our world that we think is not right and not good, but God has a different plan. We need to remember that in times of suffering. Now, that sounds kind of cheeky. That sounds kind of... You know, you know, just trust the Lord and just kind of lean on Him, and but He's not really there. And you know, 
something good will come from this and it's going to be okay. Of course, you don't want to hear that in the time of suffering. But at the same time, it is true. So this is what people ask that don't believe in God. They go, if God is good and God is great. So if you're going to be God, if God is God at all, then he has to be good and he has to be great. He has to be, if, if he is powerful enough to stop evil, bad things from happening. And if God is good enough, that he, he, he doesn't, God doesn't just sit back and he's entertained by people suffering, right? We don't believe that. God is not, he doesn't sit on his throne and he's entertained by suffering. That is certainly true. He's not entertained by that. In fact, we see Jesus uh, with Lazarus' death, he's weeping and grieving along with Mary and Martha in, in the Gospel of John. So he's not entertained by suffering, but he does allow it. And so people would say that oppose God and the thought of God and the belief in God, if God is good enough to stop it and he's great enough to stop it, then why does he allow evil in this world? And they'll even stretch it to say that it's pointless evil. Why would God allow pointless evil to happen? Now, this is where we need to face this head on and, and be truthful. That God does not allow pointless evil. Now, immediately that should rise up in any th- person that has any kind of, of thinking at all, right? Would say, well, what about this situation? What about this situation? What about this happening over in, in, in Nigeria? What about this happening over in China? Why No good could ever come from that. Why would God allow this in my life? No, one, no, no good could ever come from that. As hard as it is to imagine, we're just not in the position to be able to tell that. So think of the worst example. Think of World War II. Uh, civil war. Th- th- think of just the worst things imaginable that we know from history. 9-11. Tragic events. I mean, horrific events that just as bystanders, uh, may- maybe some of us were not directly affected by, but just by bystanders being affected by it were horrific. It was just awful, awful times in history. 10, 20, 30, 50 years down the road from that event. Let's we'll say it here because we're on camera. So a, a terrible event happens in history. 50, 100, 150 years later, does anything good come from it? Well, if one good thing comes from it, we can understand and see that it's not pointless. Did anything good come from World War II? Yeah, war prevented further evil. And, and some people will say, oh, here we go. That's just the, the greater good kind of speech. Well, you, you can just say that and you can just pass it off as that. That doesn't make it any less true. That if, if, the, if the death of Adolf Hitler and the war against Nazi Germany we call bad and horrific and even evil was allowed to stop a greater and further evil, which is certainly true, then it's not pointless evil anymore. And so you can look at World War II and say that, but when it's happening in your world, so I, you know, I, um, in, in Birmingham, uh, I followed the weatherman uh, James Spann, a uh, great godly guy, uh, serves at a church in Birmingham, uh, volunteers in a children's ministry, actually a really interesting uh, guy and, and great Christian man. But uh, he's also, I think, a good weather guy too. And uh, so he says it like this when it comes to uh, right now, like springtime, uh, storms and tornadoes. Everyone asks the question when storms pop up, hey, is this going to be like April 2011 when this whole state was affected? And he says it like this, no, but if a tornado comes down your street, it is April 2011. So if, if so, World War II, uh, you know, World War III may not happen uh, in your lifetime, hopefully, but if, if death and suffering happens to you, it is World War III. Suffering is almost in some, some, some sense relative. If it happens to us, it is a war. If it happens in our family, it is suffering. It is destructive. But yet, it doesn't make it any more or less true. It may feel a certain way, 
But the truth is, is God may have reason, one, to prevent further evil, or for a greater pur- purpose and greater good. So, li- like me, my father uh, died of cancer. Horrific thing. Why would God allow that? Why would God allow cancer in the first place? But right now, my God is in glory in a perfect body and, and, and not suffering at all. So, again, the world would say, well, that's just the Christian leaning on, on the crutch. And that's just what you should say. That's what they all, all Christians say. That doesn't make it any less true. If heaven exists, and we believe it does as, as Christians... And a believer, Paul says, it is better to be out of the body in, in the presence of, of the Lord. Jesus t- says to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. There's that, that's not language of any kind of soul sleep or uh, kind of in, in, in intermediate state. That's today you will be with me in paradise. Well, paradise sounds pretty good uh, as opposed to cancer on, on a fallen world and in a fallen planet and society. So we don't see it from that vantage point, but that doesn't make it any less true. There are things that God does allow in our lives and in our world to one, for a greater purpose and greater good, and two, to defeat and make sure a greater evil does not happen. I am sure that in your life, just like in my life, you can see uh, you know, even in teenage years or in our 20s where we just thought it was the end of the world was happening. But the longer we lived, I'm glad that happened. I'm, gl- I'm glad God did that. I, I, don't, I don't rejoice in that and I don't, you know, want that to happen again. I certainly don't want to go through that again. But I do see years down the road, yes, I see the fruit and the good behind that. We also, like we talked about a couple of weeks ago, we live in a, a, cur- a cursed world. We live in a broken world. Our bodies are breaking down. But again, for the Christian, the Christian is the only person that can say the future is, is going to get better. Our best life is not now. Our best life is to come. And so when it comes to suffering and it comes to facing suffering head on, we, one of the things that we need to remember that a lot of people believe that God is sovereign and God is control. But we as Christians, there's, there's a difference between believing that on paper and saying in the Sunday school class, yes, I believe that God is, is sovereign and in control. But in the moments of suffering and pain and heartache, trusting, I don't understand it all, but God is in control and I'm trusting in that. That's what we need to believe.